We are talking about uh, Wes Mack joining us here again from Western Canada. Uh, he's really a cool guy. He's uh, he's laid back, which I like because he just soaks up life. You know what I mean? He really appreciates what life is about. And it's so reflected in his music and in his acting as well. And I got to tell you, uh, we'll talk a little bit about each, you know, but he's following up right now on his first two albums, Edge of the Storm and Soul, which get this gang, it amassed four top 20 Billboard hits, millions of streams, and it saw him, he toured, it saw him tour with Shania Twain and Florida Georgia Line, among many others. He is now releasing the third studio album, Hummingbird, and that's coming up in just a matter of mere days. And Hummingbird began production back in 2020, just before the pandemic. <laughs> we always whisper that. Uh, we don't want to throw off you know, YouTube. Uh, but just before that began, and he said it certainly you know, changed the album. It changed everything. But honestly, it allowed the album to come together in a really unique way that opened up a million new possibilities. I mean, it took everything from Zoom sessions, FaceTime calls, and sharing files across the world. And suddenly it was possible to work with anyone, anywhere to sort of collaborate on this material, which is incredible. We're going to talk about all of that. A couple of other things as well. You know, he has been uh, in a lot of some of your favorite shows on television as well. We'll talk about that as well. Um, and there's some other cool things. There's the NBC hit series Transplant as well. And uh, there's also Smallville and a lot of cool stuff. Let me just show you a couple of things that may bring back some thoughts here. Guilty Party, yes, on Paramount Plus is in that. Smallville, as I mentioned, yes, you know that one too, gang, of course. That's really, really cool to see that one. He's also, he loves Christmas, and he's been in some of your favorite uh, Christmas movies too, like Hallmark Channel. I know you guys love the Hallmark Channel. When Christmas was young, yep, A Dog Named Christmas, he was in that as well. Also a part of Chesapeake Shores and Heartland on the CBC. Of course, you guys remember we've had um, Paul Green, who's also from Canada. He's actually a good personal friend, and he's been on our show as well, and in a lot of great Canadian and American productions. If you need to see that episode, check that out on our channel here. Uh, again, Heartland and Smallville and just some of your favorite productions and shows, but also, did you know that he was in Power Rangers? Yes, Honey Girls, Cold Pursuit with Liam Neeson, the movie. Yeah, there's Hummingbird. There's the new album or the new song. And we're very excited about this. this is the album cover. We're really excited about it. Also, he's amassed over 15 million and growing, probably even more than this photo, streams of his music worldwide, which is incredible. So whether you love him for his music, you love him for his acting, you love him for the directing, whatever it may be, he's, uh, he's an entertainer that's literally on fire. And he's, he's had an opportunity. He's been doing it a long time, too. Uh, he's been doing it for many years. It didn't come overnight, the success. He's worked hard. He's built his success to where people really want to work with him. And uh, again, here's just some of the images of some of the music, all available, of course, on Spotify and everywhere that you can find music. Here he is with Shania Twain. We're going to talk about that incredible opportunity as well. And again, here's some more great shots that we have. So let's welcome our very special guest from his secret location in Western Canada in his cabin. Wes Mack is joining us. Hey, Wes, welcome to the show, my friend. Jim, <laughs> thanks for having me on. I, I seriously, I need you to follow, you know, follow me around and give me that kind of introduction <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> I feel like you know life would life would I mean it, it would take a little bit but you know everything would just go smooth <laughs> absolutely right I know because life could be crazy and and yeah. as I mentioned Wes you are wow I thought I was a multitasker but as we were prepping for the show 
I realized you have your hands and your feet in everything. I could see why you're tucked away in the cabin right now just to get some sanity and to refresh. But I don't doubt that you don't have a guitar nearby. You don't have pen and paper and computer nearby. And you're still working as you, you know, tuck away in that cabin. Oh, right? totally. Yeah. I mean, it's funny. Uh, I, I probably do almost more work out here kind of thing. You, uh, you get away from some of the city stuff and I mean, it's, you can just dig into like, uh, I mean, a lot of this record was actually all recorded here. Uh, yeah. and a lot of the, a couple of the music videos were shot here and that. So it's become, it's a, it's a place of, of, of rest and, uh, and work for sure. Absolutely. Right. You know, I, and doing my research too, I realized, as I mentioned, you've been doing this for a number of years. You've been really working hard. You've been making, you know, your name and you've got your feet in so many different areas of the industry, which is not an easy task to maintain it all. You started like really early. It was it like 11 or so you kind of like had your own band. Yeah. Yeah. I guess so. I mean, uh, wow. Yeah. That, that is kind of the, the origin of it. I, I would have been, you know, maybe 11 when I started playing guitar and when I was 13, we, we started a band that like a band stayed together for eight years until I was, you know, until I was an adult. And I actually, I, you know, I, we always laugh, me and the guys in that, um, in that band, my, my, my best friend was in it. His name's Newman. Um, and he's gone on to have like big hits. He's had a number one rock song and, and, and but, but we'll laugh and, and, and quite honestly say that that time in a band that, you know, was playing to empty venues and didn't know what we were doing was a, some of the most fun I ever had in music, but B also where I feel like I learned everything. Yeah. Uh, and it gives you a big appreciation. I remember standing backstage at like one of the larger festivals. Um, I think we were opening for like Eric Church and, and talking to one of the other guys backstage. And both of us had come up playing in like rock bands, playing in empty bars and stuff. And it, I'm grateful for that because you can't appreciate how good you have it in those moments if you haven't spent like years and years, you know, grinding away to get there. Um, I find sometimes I'll, I'll interact with... Uh, uh, artists who had things come very quickly. And I think that sometimes can kind of rob you of the sense of like what you've actually got going on. Um, if you don't have that appreciation for it. So for you, like the music came first, when did the acting bug sort of bite you? How did you get the acting sort of yeah. prowess to happen? I, um, <clears throat> I was sitting, <laughs> I, was told, uh, I was sitting in a quantum mechanics class in second year university. Um, I'm, I'm good at that stuff too, but I made the executive decision that in my arts degree, I wasn't going to get a physics minor. I felt it was going to eat up too much time. I wanted to play with my band. The lifestyle of university was, you know, its own fun thing. And so I walked out of that class, walked down to arts advising, and I dropped all my math and physics classes. And I was like, okay, I got to fill up my schedule with something for this semester. And there was a theater class that was available and I loved it. And I ended up getting involved in like a bunch of theater productions at UBC, did a couple of plays, took all the acting classes that I could there. And by the time I was graduating, uh, a couple years after my last day at UBC, I walked out of my last class in this weird serendipitous life handoff. And I got on a bus and I went downtown and I had a one line part on the Vampire Diaries. And that was sort of this like weird life handoff. Um, and that, you know, kind of just built from there. I mean, the exposure on the vampire, vampire diaries. I mean, that's, there's a, like a cult following for the vampire. Oh, totally. Diaries. Were you blown away by the response and what, what did that do as far as just exposure and people sort of digging in and finding out more about you and wanting to bring you into other shows and productions? Yeah. So it, it did a few things. Um, one, there's the infinitely novel one that to this day, I'll get a text from a friend or something who has just started watching the Vampire Diaries clearly. I'm like, you're on the Vampire Diaries? And I'm like, just one line, man. And and notably, my character's name is Peeing Guy Number One. It's a very illustrious start to my career, uh, which I will say, um, at the time, I auditioned to play Peeing Guy Number One and Makeout Guy Number One. And I was like, well, you want to get Makeout Guy Number One. Sure. He's, he's mainly making out and says one line, other guy, is peeing and says one line uh make out guy got cut out of the pilot so uh so it, it worked out for the best uh, but <laughs> but probably from a career perspective it the other things it did it weirdly just made me think it was possible you you kind of get into this i i didn't grow up in like uh 
uh, a situation where I had people from the film industry around me at all. So I had no concept of like there, there was getting on a TV show or getting into a movie or something like that was, it's was this mysterious thing. Um, and that was, you know, a handful of auditions in, I booked that. Um, and as much as it was just one line and I don't even think that the show had a, had a network tied to it yet. So it was a very like small amount of money, one line probably didn't change, like give me some bombastic career, but it more than anything, put it in my head. Like, Oh, you can do this. You, you can go out audition and that there isn't some force that will stop you. Cause I think I just probably had, I assumed that you needed connections to possibly mm -hmm. get in there. And obviously that kind of thing's helpful when you can get it. Um, but it did put it in the back of my head. Okay, well, we can keep doing this. And so, you know, I just kept auditioning and, you know, flash forward many years and here we are now. Um, yeah. But that one line, I tell you, do you remember the line? Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I said that line more than any other line in any other show for whatever reason we had to, um, it was like very early in the filming of the, of, of that show. It's the pilot, right? And, and Nina Dobrov was to come in and interrogate her brother and accuse him of being on drugs. And, and, and there was a whole, there was issues with camera movements. There was issues with people changing lines. There was rewrites happening. It, none of it related to me. Like I, but I just had to over and over again, open a bathroom stall and say, whoa, pants down chick. And then walk out <laughs> frame, which to this day, uh, whoa, pants down chick. It never really made any sense because my pants were up. I also notably don't wash my hands in the scene. I asked about it. I'm like, is there any way I would get my, no, there was no time for that. So yeah, I said it a lot. <laughs> but it's, it's how you delivered the line. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's burned into my head, man. I'm, I'm wearing my own clothes in it too. I remember wardrobe. They saw me walk up and they're like, yeah, we like what you're wearing. Let's keep you in that. So it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a funny one to look back at. <laughs> you know, also too, in addition, uh, I mean, there's so many incredible things you've been a part of. Cold Pursuit with Liam Neeson. I mean, how this is like high level stuff. How did this happen? This was really cool. I mean, uh, this is one of my favorite things. And, and this I, is I, I always, stuff. Liam's one of my favorite dudes uh, I've ever worked with. He, sure. He's obviously tremendously talented, but he's also like one of the nicest. I, I really mean that. Like, not, not, not blowing smoke. Uh, one of the kindest people I've worked with and one who is in a position where if he wanted to be difficult with everyone on set, he would be allowed to because people in that position can't he's not like that at all and it was a joy working with him he was like the kindest person to every crew member but i mean this straight up same deal was an audition a callback audition and uh yeah i you know got to do it i, I remember i met him on my birthday he walked uh, in into the room we we had a rehearsal for it with me and him and the the director and you don't always get that a lot, a lot of like tv stuff there's no rehearsal like you, you show up and the thing's shot before you know it's happened this being like a, a bigger film we actually had like a day, maybe about a month in advance where it was just me and him and the director and the script supervisor just sat in a room and sort of pontificated about this. Wow. Uh, and he walked in and he goes, hello, Wesley, how are you doing? I heard you're from Calgary. We're shooting there, there. Um, and this soft, wilting Irish accent, which I'm doing a bad job of. Um, but yeah, man, it, it, it was it was just a, a, a lot of fun. You know, we got up on Fortress Mountain and so much of that was he'd said something in the rehearsal process that I didn't understand at the time, but now that I, I feel like I really get it or I, maybe I do. And he was like, hey, you know, I think we're just going to wait until we get up there and sort of see what the space does to us. Uh, and at the time, you know, he said that at like the slowest, most pontificating speed and the director kind of nodded and everyone, he has this ability to just bring the energy of the room down. Just, and me, yeah. me, I was like, what does that mean? What, what are we going to do up there? And, and, but well, I, I say all this is that like when we actually got up and filmed the thing, it was the middle of a blizzard on a mountain and we were like, it was insanely cold. There was a lot of like environmental factors going on. And then there was just like the space and the reality that like, if you see the scene where we're in, I, I walk in on him and he's got a shotgun in his mouth and the scene plays out from there. It, it was a good reminder for all future pieces acting thing that like, you can only prep so much. You can know the lines, you can know your man, but like you, you kind of have to roll with what happens in the uh, in the moment, which I think is a good creative kind of place to operate from. And yeah. he's, he, he's wise to that stuff. And he was great. 
because sometimes even on the spot, you know, the script writers have the script, they have the idea, but there can be some nuances and things that happen during the actual filming that an actor, actress, whatever, performer will bring to the table that might be a little different than what yeah. they envisioned. And then they actually incorporate that into the final product. Oh, totally. And honestly, I, I would point to working with him on that as like a turning point for me where I feel like I was just trying to keep up with him through through a lot of it because he's he's very good. He's very improvisational. He's very present. Um, and I remember afterwards being like, okay, like I, I went and did a lot more training subsequent to that, even though that's that's quite deep into my career already. Um, I just wanted to have more openness to improvisation and change. And now I look at the kind of stuff that like I will do on set you know, working on the last couple of projects I've been on, um, particularly like, the, like on the, the Imperfects, uh, it's a Netflix show I was on that came out last year. It just way more of that, like where you can watch the takes and like, if you watch 10 of them back, like you'll be doing something completely different in each take. Um, I've really started to enjoy doing a lot more of that. I, I heard, I think it's, um, it was a Viggo Mortensen quote talking about it, of just like the idea of you trying to give the editor uh, a bunch of options. You're trying to give them a canvas of paint. Like, I, and I really firmly believe this of like, if I'm directing something, I would prefer to have 10 different takes because then I can choose, okay, maybe it's like this here and it's like this here and I'm going to build a scene. Whereas if you do the same thing 10 times over again, uh, you, you leave the editor and the director at that point, no, nowhere to go. You're kind of stuck on one track. Um, right. so I, I, I found working with Liam was, was very like, I, it was eye opening to that and like the possibilities of it. You know, it sounds like as you've been a part of these different projects, you also have been really closely paying attention to what's going on around you, not just from what's on the script that you have to say and perform, but really watching the directors, the producers, the camera people, everybody and see how all of this is put together from yeah. the ground floor up. And it sounds like you've always been conscious of that and you've been really soaking it all in, which has allowed you to be able to do some of these things on your own, directing, producing. Would you say that you've done that? You've always watched when you're on set, see how yeah. it's all put together? It's been a really big deal for me. I Early early in this, I, as early as um, I think the second show I ever worked on, maybe not so much on, on Vampire Diaries because my head was still spinning, but... I, on the first few things I worked on, I would find the cinematographer on every show and I would say, Hey, I'm Wes. I'm playing so-and-so. Uh, do you mind? I won't ask you any questions. I'll, I'll stay out of your way. I'll shut up. And if you want me to leave, I'll leave. Do you mind if I just shadow you? Do you mind if I just hang out and watch? I don't want to go sit in my trailer between, between takes. I, I, I don't need to do that. I would rather uh, just sort of see what you're doing. And I never had a cinematographer answer with anything other than like, oh, yeah, absolutely. Like, here, this is what this is. Da, 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 da. Um, and I feel like it kind of allowed me to get a free film education where it was like when, when I switched into I started directing music videos like a few years into that. I remember specifically being like, oh, cool. I know how to do this. Like I've seen how they light for for this kind of thing. Or like there was a thing I, I learned on Smallville. This is like I, I always remember this. We were, we were shooting the coverage of, of one character. And we were really short on time. We were trying to get something before end of day. And, and they're like, okay, we're going to do it. Run a French reverse on this it's sort of a film term where it's you, 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 you will film one character uh, uh, and then you will shoot the other half of the scene. You'll put the same character standing in the same spot and you'll just shift the camera a little bit. Uh, uh, so it, and shift the eye lines around. So what you do is you only have to light for one situation and you only need a background that works for one situation. You don't have to right. move the crew all around, but you can get something done in kind of half the time if you're, if you're pressed. Uh, and I've done that many times now in, in shooting music videos where like, okay, we don't have time to turn this room around. Or maybe you have a great location looking one way, but you've got like, you know, a busy street the other way and you can't use it. Uh, this is just, you know, one random thing that I remember picking up, but you, you really got to be there to, to get that kind of stuff. You know? And then the continuity, I've been on a lot of shoots where even commercial shoots for just commercials where they're up against the sun setting. Oh, yeah. we've got to get it done now because it's, yeah. it's got the lighting has to match and we're not going to be able to recreate it and oh, blah, yeah. blah, blah. You're up against the elements too as well. Yeah, when you're sun, up. Sun, sunset is the most glorious and terrifying time on any film shoot because it does so much work for you. You get that golden magic hour. 
uh, but you know you're getting eaten alive by time. And you all of a sudden, you'll pass that quintessential point where you can no longer film anything uh, for it. It'll just look completely different. That's it. That's a wrap till tomorrow, folks. Yeah. Yeah. You, you mentioned Smallville, and that's another <laughs> classic. I mean, it's an early one. <laughs> well, <laughs> the oh, young man cometh. Uh, or Dr. Fate. How did this come about? I mean, there's another. I mean, these are not small little things that are we're talking about here. Congratulations yeah. on it all. Thanks. Uh, this was in a similar era. This was uh, same year as that. Um, uh vampire diaries yeah same deal I, I think i'd auditioned like four or five times for smallville by the time i booked this uh because it was it was one of those shows that shot in vancouver for long enough like supernatural where like it was the, sort of the running gags like everybody you get your smallville badge at some point when you work on the show um yeah and i mean he, i couldn't have been luckier to get that particular part you know because it went from they decided to do this sort of one-off TV movie. It was a two hour episode they did and they did this whole justice society thing. It was uh, basically a huge amount of emphasis given to a small roster of guest stars, myself being the, the villain of the episode. So it was really, it was really neat. Like, again, this is seven months into my like pro level acting career. And it, it felt like the biggest thing in the universe of all of a sudden, oh, yeah. cause like, you know, uh, I, it's not like I was a lead on the show forever, but for, you know, for a month of time, I was there working on this thing and I got to be the guy and do the big choreography fight scenes and have special effects. And I, I remember being at the small folk Christmas party and a guy <laughs> came up to me and he was like, he was very drunk <laughs> and, and, and he had this uh, lovely date with him and he came up to me. He's like, Hey, I was in the CG department. I, 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 I worked on that one shot of you where you shoot the ice bullets out of your hand. He's like, did you know, did you know that when you shoot those ice bullets, your right hand dips a little lower than your left. And I had to fix it. And, he, and I kept on trying to stop him and be like, Hey, like, who's your, who's your date? Like bring her into the conversation. Cause she was standing there, maybe looking a little She's impatient. Like, oh boy. Yeah. And I, and I, <laughs> there he goes but, again. <laughs> but, but I realized it, it was very um, insightful in that for me, we filmed that shot once I went like this you know and, I, I, and for him that was like two months of work like he he yeah, picked yeah. his one i oh, guess yeah. you know the board comes down everyone yeah. will choose the shot they want to work and that was his baby um and so you just that's it's a big perspective thing when you work on any film project that like yeah. your little incidental choice there the fact that my hand dipped a little lower i guess made either problems or or neat scenarios for 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 him it's uh it's it, it's just such a I love that it's this giant team that ends up. It really it, it takes yeah. a village to put everything Not together, true. right? You know, like even with the music, you'll have people maybe come in that will play a particular instrument. They're doing what needs to be done, and then they move on. But it'll take you months, if not years, oh, to yeah. work on the finished product, right? So I, I often say uh, that being like a hired gun guitar player, drummer, or like player. Um, is far more similar to being an actor in that as an actor, you're a co you know, a little cog in the machine. You come and do your song and dance and then you're out. Yeah. The, the, the producer on, on like a movie or a director would be closer almost to being an artist in music because yeah, as the artist, you're responsible for the whole thing of how it comes together, the sound, you know, you're orchestrating the mix and the master and, and, and ultimately even the marketing for it ends up falling, you know, being wrapped up in the artist. Whereas you, the actor, I mean, you might be involved in some promotional arm of a film or, or TV show, but not in the way of like needing to orchestrate it yourself, uh, unless it's, you know, an indie and it's really your baby, in which case you're probably a producer. Exactly right. Yeah. And of course, another fantastic one, the CBC's very famous Heartland. How did this come about as well? Huh? This is kind <laughs> of a neat one for me. I mean, this... Uh... This honestly opened up a lot of the doors in my like country music career, getting to play right. Austin, Austin Mars on this show. But um, I, uh, I, I, I got an audition to play the character Austin Mars, who was Austin Perkins at the time. Uh, I read for it, and and I was told that it was down to me and like two or three other guys. And I was living in Vancouver. The show shoots in Calgary, and was cast out of Calgary. And so I had this sort of harebrained scheme bit of a gambit because this could backfire but basically i had my agent tell them that like i was going to be in calgary anyways which is not true i flew specifically for this uh <laughs> and that like hey maybe they'd want to meet me if they're still considering this i'd come by the production office 
And so I, at the time, had just finished the production on my first album, uh, Green Flag, which I never actually released. It's this like unreleased early album. I recorded all of it myself, mixed it, yada, yada. Uh, so I brought a copy of that down and met the producers and just sort of like let them know like, hey, I actually am a country musician. I'm also an actor. I hear you guys are considering this. But what I think ended up kind of bizarrely cinching it was um, one of the producers on the show had also been a producer on this other Canadian show called Road to Avon Lee that I used to watch with my parents when I was a kid. And there was a character on it named Gus Pike who played the fiddle. And it was like quite pivotal into me wanting to get into music. And through random course of conversation that came up uh, and she's like, I made that show. Like I was involved in that episode kind of thing. And I was like, no way. Like it's kind of part of the reason I'm sitting here. Uh, I feel like as I was driving home, I got a call from my agent saying I had the part. Um, wow. So it was one of those instances where that could have backfired where you look like a crazy person who has shown up at the production office. Um, but yeah, so, so that was a little little bit of luck. Uh, going. I also like that. being a part of that, cause, you know, having that role, because obviously that's another, there's a huge fan base for that too, Heartland. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, Heartland has a has an awesome, dedicated, rabid fan base of, of people all over the world. I mean, we were only yeah. in season, I think, five when I did that. And, they, you know, they're still still going with that. And, yep. and uh, it was really cool. It, it was the most chill set and like but that was one i think the first time i'd worked on something in alberta it was just very laid back and no one shouting at each other no one running around it was like very wholesome and 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 fun to be a part of really beautiful locations to be shooting in um totally different from some of the like procedurals shot in vancouver where things get pretty fast paced and like tensions can run high this was like so a laid back environment and and you know i got to play music on the show that ultimately yeah. uh kind of carved the way into my music career great exposure <laughs> right they yeah didn't know that you the ones that didn't know you did music and you were involved in music for years got a chance to sample it through the show yeah and and then the the fellow who i uh jeff johnson is a good friend of mine who i wrote my first like hit song with the thing that went top 10 as an independent artist and like gave me a, a shake at this whole thing um i think me being in heartland was kind of something that put me on his radar um and was was instrumental in getting me into that sort of first right with him uh we worked together on a number of things he he uh, produced half my first record and uh, developed me as an artist and 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 we toured around he came on the Shania tour as my guitar player and stuff so uh, I I don't know if that connection would have been made if not for the heart and it, it's funny when you kind of pick apart the layers in all of this of like oh if not for this then that doesn't happen then connected doesn't right happen. yeah it's all con and sometimes you can't plan it out sometimes you just happen to be at a, in a room where somebody's having a conversation they overhear you say something like Oh, you do that? Hey, give me a call and let's see if we can collaborate. Or, you know, we're looking for somebody that does that. Or yeah. it, it's unusual sometimes how some of these incredible things come about, right? Oh, totally. I, I think a, a lot of the best things that have ever happened in my life have come out of random nonsense or out of unfortunate things that had happened beforehand, you know? Um, weirdly, some of the more challenging chapters in my life and career have often spawned something unexpected and good out of them <laughs> which is you know it's just i guess nice looking back the career is built on random nonsense yeah I yeah it. i mean it, it sure seems to it you, you can work very hard and i and i think i do but you, there's just so much that's out of your hands that uh, you just can't like mold and shape and form you just no. got to be ready and, and ready to to go with it. You know, it, when you were in Smallville, how long did it take for the makeup to put that together like that? That was, I was in the, the chair for the longest every day. Yeah. Uh, I imagine. think it was at least two hours. So like there was one morning we finished shooting really late and we were back at it early the next morning. And I didn't have a car at that point in time. And I lived an hour away from where we were filming. It was transit. And I, I, just, I just stayed in the trailer overnight, which you're not supposed to do. But I just like slept. It was, it was a few hours. I woke up a few hours later and I was like, all right, we're back. Um, <laughs> it, yeah. was, it had to be done because, yeah, it was a long time. It, it was admittedly it was a little challenging. They'd, the makeup team would put on like gas masks to spray me down with this oh, like wow, um, really? 
like really potent paint. sort of it, it, yeah. it was uh like glittery kind of thing it gave my my skin this shimmering you know quality to it that made me look you know icy uh, uh on camera you, you, you can't see it as much here it, this actually this photo might have been before they applied it it was like a final metallic sort of powder to it but so they would be wearing gas masks and i'm just sitting there breathing this in uh wow. so, you know was it, was, it cold uh yeah it was cold but it also just like it made me cough like crazy yeah, yeah. <laughs> again it was my first sort of really big role so there's there's i learned some things on it to be sure power rangers too another classic how'd this oh, come yeah. about it's like 2017 ish around? yeah yeah 2017 this came out i i remember i shot it on my birthday another birthday one and boy a lot of things happen on your birthday yeah huh? it does I, i've many years been filming stuff on my birthday keep uh, the phone on on your birthday yeah <laughs> yeah seriously man um it's, it's my, my birthday is Ides of March. So, uh, <laughs> crazy mm -hmm. things, but, uh, yeah, that, again, that one, I remember I got the script for it and it was all, uh, redacted because they were, it was quite top secret at the time, but being a diehard, like Power Rangers fan from when I was a kid, it was very yeah. obvious, like immediately what it was. Um, yeah, so yeah. 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 Uh, it, it was a ton of fun. I mean, it, they, there was one sequence <laughs> where we were shooting outdoors and the director was saying something effectively. Well, there's going to be these things flying overhead. They're, they're called Zords. And somebody was on the set and was like, what are Zords? And I like launched into a like, there are these giant mechanized things that the Power Rangers use when they, you know, when, when they can't overpower Rita. And I just, you know, I geeked out, man it was a big part of my so childhood. you you brought up the memory and you yeah. knew <laughs> yeah totally that's cool and then guilty party too is another one paramount plus that's a fantastic one yeah to be part of. i really happen? enjoyed uh that was uh this was a neat one this was i think the first piece of work i maybe booked during the pandemic when we started yeah, so, yeah yeah and kate was lovely she she's uh uh he kept from that similar, actually, Liam Neeson, Neeson sort of cloth of just like super kind to everyone around, doesn't take herself too seriously in a way that, right? Like, uh, uh, anecdotally, here, like, um, there's one scene where I'm supposed to be, we're, we're co workers in the show, and I'm supposed to be distracting her and sort of taking the piss out of what she's she's trying to give this impassioned speech to the staff, and I don't take her very seriously. And I was eating, I brought Fruit Loops to set that day that I was eating, that was Fruit a Loops, choice yeah. I made for just eating them dry. And she's like, oh, Wesley, what if you throw the Fruit Loops at me? <laughs> you know, and you try to beam me with them. And I was like, do I have permission to do that? Like, what if I, and she's like, yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm like, all right, Kate, I can sell, I'll throw Fruit Loops at you. Um, and so for the duration of the scene, anytime I felt like it, I would just whip them at her face. Uh, I, I landed one in your ear at one point in time. Uh, <laughs> it, it, and, and it was good because it pushed her character. It made her like speech funnier as the, the more she, her character tries to be serious through right. this through this thing. Uh, uh, but what I admired about that is that like she's the star on the show, and that she routinely would do stuff like that, where it was like, "Oh, here's an idea that that where I where she's the butt of the joke, and she was cool with that. She didn't take herself too seriously to not see that that like, oh, that helps the show and ultimately makes her look better. Um, but she, she was just very fun and chill to work with. I mentioned too that you you like Christmas. So do I. I love Christmas. Right? It's one of I my do. favorite days of the year is Christmas. And as a kid, I used to always be like sort of down the day after Christmas because of all the build up to that oh, huge, yeah. fabulous day. And you've had it up to we have a lot of uh, viewers here on our show that also love just they soak up just about anything they see on the hallmark channel and yeah, hallmark yeah. hall of fame and you've had an opportunity to be in you know a lot of different things but some of them christmas based too like a dog named christmas huh yeah yeah that was very fun that was another early one that was one of the first things i ever got to work on. it's kind of an oddball in that my work on it um we kind of got to shoot this mini war movie that exists inside a dog named christmas you have your like very wholesome uh, uh, a Christmas film that's playing out. But then you have Bruce Greenwood's uh, character is having flashbacks to his time in the Vietnam War where yeah. I was playing him. So we, for like three days or four days or something, went and shot this like mini war movie. And everyone was laughing because like, you know, the, the rest of the set was all decked out with like for Christmas the stuff. And then we're being, you know, dressed in fatigues and have like members of the military there to like advise on what we're doing. <laughs> I was like, this is, this is a wild time. Uh, <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah, it was neat. It gave some emotional gravity to it for sure. When Christmas was young, another one. Yeah, that was a lot of fun last year. Uh, uh, working with Tyler on that was great. Um, I got to play one of my tunes on it. 
uh, which was very fun. I got to have a song that my uh, that I wrote with my dad uh, that, that featured in the in, in this movie. How cool is that? Huh? Uh, it, it was tremendously cool. We actually I've, I've had it. We have used it in, in this is the second Christmas movie that it was in the first one. We, we did it for is in a movie called Joy for Christmas. Um, I got to surprise him with it on Christmas Day because uh, he didn't know he, he had you know sent me the song like a ways before and i had actually taken the tracks that he recorded for it um a bunch of his stuff his guitar playing some of his vocals and then i'd messed around with it further and recorded my vocals and added like an like an orchestral piece and a full band to it um and then it was featured in the film and on christmas day me and my family watched it and and he knew it was my like that i was in the movie obviously but didn't know his song was going to be featured and all of a sudden his song comes on and starts wow. playing and yeah it was it was it was like my favorite thing I got to give to him. Very because cool. your dad has been a big influence musically as well, too, because he's been in the music industry, right? Yeah. Yeah. He, uh, back in 1969, I believe, had a number one hit in Canada uh, called The Cruel War, the band called The Sugar and Spice. How cool is that, huh? Uh, it's very, it very cool. I, I find it infinitely cool. I, I'll see, you know, photos of, of his band from that from that era you know they had a bus that had flowers on the side of it and, and still is like the quintessential they have a VW bus uh, i think i think so yeah 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 it's like it's it's what you imagine when you think of the late 60s you know they've got a photo shoot where one of the guys is holding like a sword and stuff it's you know it, it's it's very um if you were just trying to shoot a movie of like a 60s looking band you'd it was perfect that. yeah yeah so that was that's always been tremendously cool for me and and a really good song too like canada's version of the monkeys <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right on, eh? you know they came out vw volkswagen has come out they're bringing the bus back as really? electric, in electric form in the whole yeah modernized electric version of that 60s 70s bus oh, it's back. So cool yeah because that's such an iconic piece retro right yeah, totally. Here's totally. something else digging up from the past, Honey Girls. Oh man, <laughs> yeah, this is a fun one too. I mean, I kind of got to play myself. I, I they pulled me in as as I was supposed to be, I think, a songwriter slash record producer into to help the girls, you know, work on their on their writing craft. And okay. it's funny, we were actually shooting it in the studio in Vancouver where I had made one of my records. Uh, so it felt like just sort of a day of oddly playing myself. I think I was in my own clothes too. I think they liked what I, what I showed what you up had. Like. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it was, it's sort of surreal where there's like, Hey, you just, you just you in this one, you just show up and tell them, you know, this is how you write a song. Or something. <laughs> hey, this fun. is Wes yeah. and this is me as me, which is kind of cool. And you get a chance to do that. You also had involvement with this too, right? Yeah. I've had a handful of different things kind of yeah. around in Chesapeake Shores. I I've had a couple of songs that they used in the show. I had, um, uh, most notably would have been free fall, uh, which is one that I, I wrote and was on my first album. And then they used it, uh, Jesse Metcalf, uh, and my friend, Brittany Willisey, uh, just recorded an awesome version of it. Funny enough, at that same studio where we where where the song was originally recorded, then they recorded their version there, not knowing that it was uh, recorded there, and then we shot Honey Girls there. Uh, so all in that same same studio in Vancouver. But they used that in the finale. I think it actually played in a couple of episodes. But they they used Free Fall, and it was like a big pivotal moment in the in the show. And and then when when the whole show uh, like when they're series finale closes down you take the the main theme of the show um uh, I, I actually got to sing on the final song that closes out the, the singing home um and that was really fun that was just a, a friend of mine was doing the music for the show and called me up and asked if i'd come in for for a couple hours and be the male voice on it to close out the whole thing so that was really um that felt really special because the fans on that show are tremendous and have been such a welcoming force and to get to play a small part in the final moments there that kind of closed out the series uh, felt really special. You know, you have some other cool things happening. You're set to appear in the lead role in the heartwarming Christmas film, Cape Holly Christmas, where art imitates life. And you portray a country musician named Luke performing multiple original and classical Christmas, uh, classic Christmas songs just in time for the holiday season. And the film was shot at uh, your home, province of alberta earlier this year yeah 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 that was a fun that was awesome was that? That, was, that was a black once again it was filming during my birthday 
uh, uh, you know, always, always getting those, those breaks. <laughs> yeah, just, Next time yeah. you're back on the show, I'm coming up to Canada and we're going to do it on your birthday. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> dude, seriously. It's uh, it's always the time for it. Um, no, it, it was once again, like, um, it's fun getting to like, I mean, I, I've gotten to play some like insane, you know, psycho villains and stuff, but it's also, it's, you know, getting to play a musician on it is neat because you get to do the thing that I know how to do quite well. You put a guitar in my hands. Um, I feel comfortable in those. If anything, those are the days that feel pretty chill on sets where it's just like, oh, cool. We're going to get me to sit around and sing some Christmas songs. Um, yeah, that that one was was a ton of fun. We, we went up there and again, I, I'm a big Christmas fan. So yeah, uh, it's like I get an extra hit of it in January there, just when you're <laughs> or uh, in, in March when we shot it, just when you're kind of running. We did a little, we did a little digging and we do have some evidence of it. I showed it earlier. It's like, boom, look at this. He does love oh, Christmas. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> indeed. Yeah, that was on uh, that was on Joy for Christmas. There, I think I did like eight songs or something in that. They were kind of trying to use me like the uh, the town troubadour out of Gilmore Girls. They wanted just right. like, dude on dude on the corner uh, ripping Christmas tunes. Music again, big part of your existence, and you had this incredible opportunity, as I mentioned in the beginning of the show. And we welcome everybody who's watching. I'm Jim Masters, and. Wes Mack is here coming to us live from uh, Canada, a fantastic actor and musician and singer, producer, director, millions of streams, all kinds of awards for his work. He's got an opportunity to uh, work with Shania Twain. How did that happen? I'll never know how that happened. That one to me <laughs> remains you're, the biggest. You're still, thinking, you're still in a dream sequence over, yeah, don't man, you? Yeah, I kind of am. It feels... Uh... I still mm. don't know how it really came together. Like I, you know, I had I had some hits on the radio at that point in time, but I still don't know. Uh, that allegedly came from her camp <laughs> that wow. they asked me to come and I open. All heard all about the, you, yeah. I, I, you know, there's I have a number of theories on you know what maybe put that on her desk, but I've never had anyone like through, through any of the people I worked with, any of the labels, managements, like truly come forward and be like, I orchestrated that. So it actually remains kind of unknown to me as well yeah um yeah and tell us what happened what you know how that yeah, we got the, to yeah. do 18 dates across canada and, and one in the states actually we did the seattle the opening of the whole tour there yeah um yeah i mean that was that was easily like the most fun kind of crazy thing i've ever been able to participate in it was you know two months of my life where like i lived and breathed shania twain tour and like there, there's yeah, there's no, I don't know, like what super single talented. story. To, to yeah, it, it was right? just so much fun. Nice and person. She, and... she was wonderful. She pulled us aside on the first day and was just like, hey, Wes, like, you, you know, you, you'll sometimes you'll see me around lots. Sometimes you won't see me at all. Like, I'm a kind of private person. But like, man, we're happy to have you on the, on the tour. Like, and like right from, I remember the first show uh, I got up on on stage in, in Seattle and I was probably like a little stiff, you know, just like first time playing in a, an arena show and I was singing Party for Two with her. And, you know, I, I knew the song well. The music starts playing. And you know, I'm standing there. And she, and she looks over and she gives me this big introduction to the crowd. And she goes, Wes, get closer to me. And puts her hand around my waist and pulls me over. And I was like, oh, what is even happening? It was this very, very surreal. Um, it was just a blast. Like her her band, the the whole support crew herself. Uh, everybody was was tremendously supportive of us. And, yeah, like yeah. super pro. They they just made us look great in our show every night and made everything easy. It, it was just a blast night after night. And like the the her show is tough to top. You know, it was like it has all the the yeah. knowledge that she gleaned in doing like the Vegas uh, uh, stuff great. paired with years of doing doing arenas. She's wonderful up there. And like we got to every night just play to sold out arenas. So. No complaints. <laughs> Best uh, thing ever. Absolutely not. No, and that and that is a you know it's it's a feather in the cap, and th the fact that you know they found you, you just can't top it. It's really incredible, huh? Yeah, it, it was it was pretty nice. I, I was very aware that it was like it was quite surreal each night, and like you know it's one of those life events where I remember thinking like, cool. If I never do anything ever again in the whole entertainment industry after this, like I'll have always done this. Uh, and and that, that feels really special. Uh, I, I feel infinitely grateful to have gotten to do that. I mentioned Cold Pursuit. I mentioned Guilty Party. And you mentioned briefly 2022 Netflix series, The Imperfects. Yeah. He spent multiple weeks in global top you know, three show lineup. It, it, it's incredible the amount of things you had an opportunity to be a part of. What was it like? being with uh, the imperfects that was a lot of fun that that one i was just given a lot of room to play i'd actually originally um 
auditioned to play a different character on the show, a guy named PJ, and I, I booked the role. Uh, and then it had one day overlapping with my last day on Guilty Party. Um, and just they couldn't swing it to change either schedule. So I lost the role and I was, I was bummed. And they're like, oh, we'll try and get you back. Like, you know, I was like, yeah, okay, I appreciate that. Like, that sounds like, a, you know, one of those things where it's, you know, we'll call you on the next Don't one. Don't call us, we'll call you. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> totally. And, and sure enough, like a week later, I had an audition to play uh, Owen. Um, and kind of serendipitous in that, I really click more with Owen, you know, like PJ was, was a, a bass player in the band, like very rock starry kind of thing. And like totally in the wheelhouse of stuff I can do. But Owen was this like young man trying to cope with the fact that he all of a sudden had superpowers, but he was really interesting within the show. Most of the cast on the show is, is their characters are a little more jaded and a little more upset that they've been given powers. And that's sort of the tone of the show is they're trying to like, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to get that reversed where, where, whereas my guy was sort of this oddball, very altruistic character written in has spent his life reading comic books and voila, all of a sudden has superpowers. Uh, so you plunk me into it. And I, I just got to be the geekiest side of myself uh, paired with, halfway through the episode i become like a copper infused rage monster who's trying to kill everyone um so, so it was very fun you, you know i got to kind of play both sides of you know I, it's definitely in my wheelhouse to play those kind of villains but i got to play also a softer almost comedic kind of character who everyone's just dumping on uh it was it was very fun they, they were very down with like improvisation in that so there's yeah. many takes where the stuff that actually makes it in both lines I say, and just like choices of things to do were very like different take to take and they got to carve together whatever they wanted it to be in the end. And so I, I, I had a tremendous amount of fun working on that. I mentioned Power Rangers. We talked about Smallville, Heartland, Vampire Diaries, but also you're in Supernatural and the 100, DC Legends of Tomorrow, iZombie and Motive, <laughs> Magic Beyond Words, the JK Rowling story and the Phantoms. Yeah. <laughs> it's, been a, it's, it's been a long road man <laughs> been at it for a bit yeah it's uh I'm, it's funny when you like you, know, you list them all off it's uh yeah i'm grateful to have gotten it done it's a bunch of different chapters in my life and things there's just like a flood of memories that comes with each of those you know and some of them were amazing experiences and some were tougher and some were during easy points in my life and some were then things were chaotic and busy um and yeah you have no control over any of that but i'm i'm grateful to get to you know still be just making art and doing that kind of stuff that's what it is and of course music is obviously a huge huge part of that and uh, in such a, a glorious way which i think is really really awesome just showing some of these covers here and uh you know how often do you get a chance i mean is music what comes first for you is music the number one thing in the acting is is right there but underneath no i'd say that i'd say they're even 50, pretty 50. even keel I, i'm not I don't know. I, I, it's weird in different circles. Some of the music people really want you to always answer that music is your core passion. Some people want to know that you're an actor first. I, I'm just like, I don't know, man. Like I, I like to drive my car and brush my teeth too. Uh, you know, right. like to, to, it, and maybe not at the same time, but uh, a lot of people I, do the, yeah, <laughs> at the same they're, time. They're, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's a whole other thing. I mean, it, it probably actually is about as difficult balancing those as sometimes balancing these careers. I've seen people uh, read books while driving. Oh uh, dude, you and me both. Uh, I feel like in the self-driving or semi self driving cars here that's only gonna uh, get um but yeah it it um i really do love both if if yeah. they're, they're they're different they're they're just different things i like doing man if, if, a great day acting on set or on a play or something like that or being in a recording studio or playing a show that those, those things are are both great you know I, anytime i can be doing any kind of creative stuff i'm i'm quite happy which is cool, right? And, uh, you know, you're banging out the music, too, which I think is really, really cool. This is a, we use this in the promo. That's such a cool shot. Thanks. Yeah, that's playing at Mac Hall on that one in Calgary, um, opening for Florida Georgia Line. It was uh, pretty surreal, uh, that particular stage. What was um, that like, working with them? Well, it was neat, because it was really early. Um, we did a couple of shows with them, these Thousand Seaters, 
right before they like went supernova and, and, and became like some of the, you know, as big as they are now. Um, and they're great. Honestly, we, we did this couple of shows. I remember after that particular show, which was, so is it Calgary Mac hall, which is where I'd seen like every show when I was a teenager growing up, like that was just a place you went and saw concerts. So and it's cool getting to play. Anybody there. just tuning in that that's your hometown Calgary. Yeah. Right? And, and so after the show, they were just like, you know, this does not happen with, with every uh, band you play with when you're an opener. They came and grabbed me and the guys in my band. They're like, hey, like we, we got like, you know, party going on in our dressing room here. You, you want to come hang out? And like we spent the night both times just like hanging out, drinking beers with these guys. Um, they're great. Uh, one more time where it was like. I've, I have worked with people who are quite difficult, but I've got fortunately a good stack of stories here of like people who have risen quite high that are easy to deal with and like, you know, seem grateful to be there. Absolutely. Congratulations too on this. That's uh, coming out. What a fantastic cover too. Before we talk about the music, let's talk about even the design of the cover. Yeah. Well, first off, uh, uh, I'm glad you dig it. I, I want to do a, a big uh, uh, shout out to my, one of my best friends, Kyle Bottoms, who I've actually known since I was five and wow. he did the art for this. Um, so Kyle and I have a, a good, like push pull relationship of like, I do a fair bit of graphic art as well. I'm not as talented as he is by any means. Um, but so I remember I'd sent him like a couple images for this and like yeah. inspirations for a canvas and the photo. And I was like, I think it's kind of like this, but this is what he came back with. And, cool. and he's actually, he's done the art for, for me from like day one I see, of, really? of my, of my music stuff. Uh, and he's just like, yeah, we've just been good buds. Like, uh, he also, you know, I've, I got. Over the course of COVID, I got pretty into playing Dungeons and Dragons, and he's uh, he's on he's on my crew for that. So I see a lot of him through that as well. But, Did you uh, gain any weight? Like everybody uh, else? You <laughs> yeah, know probably. why? Uh, you know why? There's a reason why. Because you know they told us Wes, we had to be six feet six feet apart from one another, right? You had to be six, yeah, yeah. You know, six feet apart. But what they failed to tell us is we were supposed to be ten feet away from our refrigerators. <sighs> Didn't, we didn't get that intel, man. We didn't like, get that part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely the exercise might have plummeted a little during that. That just sort wow. of like, but uh, yeah, the artwork <laughs> for that is absolutely stunning. And and tell us about the name and the music and congratulations because yeah. this is hot off the presses generally here. Yeah, right? yeah. And so the art I dropped it today. Um, so there's a lot to this actually. I, you know, I really cared a lot about you know the, how the visuals on this would come together and so the name hummingbird is a couple things uh uh so there was a at my studio in vancouver there was one or two we're not, we're not actually sure hummingbirds that would often come by and and drink out of the fountain that my girlfriend had put up and and so we'd always get to watch them and it was always this really magical thing so she actually suggested the title and 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 told me that like oh did you know like hummingbirds are the only birds that can actually fly forward and backward um that they're capable of doing that with their neat hovering um so i thought that was kind of apt because this record was developed you know and came together through covid which really felt like a lot of stepping backward in in order to go forward you know and figuring Most out like okay and face time yeah you had to really work with people like all over right totally so you had to totally rework everything and so it seemed like this app title where you know, I got really into hanging out with birds throughout uh, the pandemic. There's a there's a duck pond near me where by the end of the pandemic, because they didn't know get, what was going on, they no. were still doing their thing. Totally. And so I could get blackbirds to land on my hand. Ducks would come and hang out, and then we had hummingbirds visiting our apartment all the time. Um, so that you know, my my girlfriend suggested the title. Uh, so shout out to Emma, much love and thanks for that. Um, and I was like, okay, cool. So now I want something that sort of. Um, feels like that i didn't want to just stick a picture of a physical hummingbird on it so i chatted with my pal kyle and we kind of brainstormed for a while and we went for this kind of paint narrative um you know of all the like different colors that kind of went into the record That's really um cool. yeah so I'm, I'm a big fan of 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 the title and 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 the art and, and of the music and, and how that came together in like a very very strange phase of life did he do this too, or is this? You know, this weird. This one's actually me it's on um, your website. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, this one. Where are put, you? Because the water in Canada is frigid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this is. Uh, it was very this cold. Is so this, <laughs> this is at my cabin. My uh, my girlfriend took this picture. We're actually shooting the music video for "Don't Change." So this is actually film footage that I just pulled a still frame from. Oh, cool. And. I mean, I can take my process apart. I, I think I probably used about four apps. I think I did all the art on this, like all the processing on this on my phone. Did you? Um, 
Yeah, I just took it through a bunch of different apps. Uh, I mean, I, I do it for a bunch of uh, film photography as well. Right. This kind of almost looks like that. This actually is a digital, um, but I put it through a bunch of stuff. But it was it was quite chilly, and I spent you know maybe an hour or so in the water that day when we were filming. Um, and I'm, I'm far weaker than my girlfriend when it comes to this stuff. She was fine at the end. I was like just Cause shivering it, and destroyed. Cause it almost uh, looks like you're looking at the other person saying, okay, did you get the shot? Yeah. Did yeah. Oh, there's shot? definitely, yeah. We had to edit the feet a lot of numb. <laughs> oh, I was, I couldn't feel it. And I'm wearing full clothes. I was wearing jeans and a sweater in the lake. It doesn't make any <laughs> sense, but it, but it did make it for a cool shot. Um, it's awesome. And, yeah. And it was, this was actually during the, the first lockdown. And so we were up here at the cabin. Uh, our flights home had been canceled. And at this point in time, there was no real way to like use another crew. It was still very isolated. So it was just myself and, and Emma shot the whole video um, and, and put it together. Like it just a ton of the stuff that's in this record was done in these really insular boxes where it was like, cool, one person is working on this. Or like, you know, that was the first time I think I, there's a guitar solo in that song that I played, um, which, and I normally hadn't done that before. It kind of re-unlocked, like I used to do a lot of that kind of stuff. And then you get into the big, like sort of Nashville machine of it and you farm everything out to people who are probably objective. No, certainly objectively more talented than I am, but it's kind of neat when you get to pull it back to you. And, and it's not necessarily like the, playing the guitar solo on that song was, was neat because it's surely not the most like technically proficient solo, but it feels, uh, it feels kind of in, inspired. I, I had a, I had a driving instructor years ago. This is, I was, I was an adult. I'd already been driving a car for years, but for one of the movies I was in, I needed to be able to drive a, a standard transmission. I'd, I'd never driven one of those before. So I booked some, you know, in-car driving lessons as you would when you're a teenager. And I was like, cool, like, you know, I need to learn how to do stick. So, you know, for a few hours we went and drove around. And I remember for, for whatever reason it burned into my head, he was talking about his favorite guitar players. And he's like, oh, I always like listening to guitar players on records who aren't actually that good. He's like, you can tell how much harder they have to work at it to like get something inspirational across uh, than someone who is just like an absolute shredder. And it, I weirdly think there's some validity to that when you like look at art, especially in an era of like when things are digital and you have infinite options, you can create with anything. You can hire anyone onto it. You can use samples of an infinite number of things. Um, sometimes it's nice to almost give yourself some constraints. I, I remember reading an interview with Jack White at one point where he talked about like, he tries to fit a whole song on like a third of a page, you know, like all the lyrics, all the chords. And he's like, if we go longer than that, you just start running into too many options and too many recuts and too many possibilities where it loses focus. Uh, so sometimes I do like that. And sometimes, sometimes having to play something yourself will force you to find something interesting rather than exploring every possible option which is always the best now with hummingbird you had an opportunity you know again during this during a time when it wasn't necessarily everybody in the same studio it, this was originally started three years ago you've yeah. had an opportunity across multiple studios provinces and and counties to feature some of the biggest names in the business tell us about that yeah i mean a big thing with this was like um there was probably a pretty prior to the pandemic a lot of people were pretty hesitant myself included to do like zoom or earlier skype rights um and, and, and you know it was more you had to be there in, in the room uh and i didn't particularly like the vibe of you know doing it on on camera it wasn't wasn't quite the same um all of a sudden that option disappeared so you had to make it work and after a while i grew to like it pretty much just as much and, and the key advantage being all of a sudden you could write with anyone anywhere, um, which I guess falls back on what I was saying before of like, maybe it gives you too many options at times. But in, the, in this instance, um, I feel like it just let me work with all the right people. Like I, I you were able to call people up and, and I got to say, this has got to be helpful for, for artists who are really early in their careers too, where sometimes like there's a financial burden to, if you need to fly to LA and to New York oh, and yeah. to, to, Los Angeles, about all to Nashville and stuff. Yeah. yeah it, that, that, that stuff gets, gets pushed aside too often. In my opinion, it's a huge privilege get, to get to make music and to get to make art and, and to be in a position to do that often requires a whole lot of other balls properly moving through the air. So I will say being able to do things like that over, over zoom, is quite liberating where it's like, cool, there's a writer that I love who is there that's available, but I don't now have to fly there and put myself up in a hotel and rent a car 
to go and do what might just be one right. Maybe, maybe I don't need to write with anyone else in that town. I feel like sometimes you can end up wasting huge amounts of time where it's like you make a whole writing trip out of something and spend thousands of dollars on it. And what you really needed was to write with one person that, you know, you do good things with. Um, even sometimes I've done zoom rights now where it's like with people in Vancouver and mm. I'm in Vancouver as well, but we live an hour apart. Right. And I'm like, well, we can well, spend just, an extra two hours driving or I can just do this right now. We can get the thing we want to get done. done. Yeah. yeah. And, and sometimes it's really nice. And, you know, you don't have the added stress of, of some of that other life stuff intervening. You can just do it in your space that works nicely for you. I mean, sometimes there's a great joy to being in the room with people. And I still like there's yeah. a huge place for that. Camaraderie, but, riffing, but, all of yeah. that. Yeah. But it's a it's another tool in the box I, I is the way I kind of view it where it's like, cool, if this... Uh, uh, you being able to do a zoom, right. Or you sending tracks to a friend of yours in another studio is the thing that makes the art happen in a good way for you. Then that's what you should do. So we're talking a lot about the advancements of technology and how it's aided in these situations. Would you also say that you are an analog guy? Do you love analog and appreciate the warmth of, of analog? Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, you gotta like, what, you know, I got one of these like old Casio watches on. <laughs> Uh, no, I'm, oh, I'm yeah. you know, I got, a, I got like a stack of film I store cameras all of that. Here. Yeah, I have that like, too. I love all that. Know, and, uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of this kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I'm someone who still has like, you know, a magazine subscription and stuff. I, I spend so much time on uh, social media and, and screens and that for work, be it editing or shooting auditions or any number of things. Yeah, I, I, I get a lot of joy out of analog stuff wherever possible um you're a bit just, of an old soul inside aren't you yeah i i definitely am someone who's repeatedly beating that. that drum i get the i get it's the cool convenience be, yeah yeah i but i just i i really enjoy whenever i can trying to inject anything that like slows things down a little bit because yeah. i feel like everything moves so fast these yeah. days well uh, you know, i always yeah. say that yeah it's moving so fast that you're rushing, rushing, rushing from here to here to here to here to do this, do this, you know, check off these boxes and all that, answer the emails, do everything you got to do. When do you have time to actually appreciate the thing that you just experienced and that you just did? I really crave for after we just did something or went somewhere, experienced something, or we just built, created, or accomplished something, a couple of minutes after yeah. to revel in it, savor in it, take a deep breath, say, wow, wasn't that incredible? I'm the guy when you go into the movie theater and you see the Titanic sink that's in the car driving back saying, let's discuss. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dude, I'm, I'm right there with you. Uh, I I think probably for both of us, like a lot of the work that you end up doing, you, you've been in many walks of the entertainment industry. It is faster and faster and faster. And it is very like, what have you done this minute? and you are expected to answer texts and emails immediately. Uh, yeah, finding those moments. It, my dad gave me a piece of advice before I did the Shania tour that I was appreciate. And he's like, hey, it's going to be crazy out there. You're going to be all over the place, a million things to a million people. And he's like, make sure every night you, you on that stage take a mental snapshot at least once because you will have those with you when you're an old man one day. And I really took that to heart and tried to every night, at least once on the stage, like stop and take it in. And, and I remember at the very end of the tour, um, on the last, on, when we played Montreal, I went and everybody else had kind of gone off to start partying and stuff. And I went and walked out into the, like up into the, the nosebleeds and I just sat there and I watched them take the stage down. And like, I probably just sat there cool. for an hour and I was and, and like, but yeah. uh, I, I appreciated that it was uh, a unique moment in my life and I wanted to, you know, it's like you said, it's kind of savor it. Cause yeah, when you're on to the next thing, like I I'm, I'm guilty of that for sure. The number of times I put out a song and by the time we're putting the song out, I'm thinking about the song that's too ahead. Uh, Cause you need to be, because that's the business of it, but it can kind of rob you of, of your, of the highlights, you know, yeah. and people, it's funny when you'll list off some of the stuff in my career that I've done, um, it, it hits me with like a gratitude wave. Yeah. Cause I'm like, Oh yeah. Like there is stuff there, but you forget about it because it's a couple of years ago. And all of a You've sudden you're thinking to the other thing. Like, right? Yeah. Well, it's, I'm thinking about something I auditioned for. Will I get that? Will I, will I get to, there's a certain scarcity to, to, to any industry, but certainly to this one where it's, it's always, what have you done lately? 
Um, next, next, so, next, next. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. So it's a balance, I think, for everybody in life to try and like appreciate the stuff that you have because we're all on this infinitely long continuum of there will always be many people with more than you and many people with less than you. Mm-hmm. And you tend to always forget about all the people with less than you. And you're just yeah. you're looking at the ones who've got more than you. And it's, it's, uh, it's not good for your brain. We're the ones in the movie theater that actually stay there finishing off the popcorn while we're watching yeah. the credits roll at the end of the movie and hearing the film score. Yeah. Until it says the end black. Then we leave. Oh, I, I love doing that. Cause that's part of the movie to me too. That's the like, uh, you know, if a director has tried to leave you with a final moment in it, there's like an amount of processing that you often need to do. Talking about the movie after the movie is half the fun of going to the movie. Um, you right. Know, that's where you get to do a little work with it. And this is, you know, like I had um, when I when I did this tonight, tour, there was there was an instance uh, we, we did like a meet and greet after the show. And, and, and like, you know, it's the first time in my career where I would have hundreds of people come to me and go, ah, this is so cool. Da, 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 da. And they tell me stories and tell me, you know, uh, and one night early in the tour, a guy came up to me and said, like, hey, man, your song before you drive me crazy. Uh, really mattered to me. Here's what it meant to me. Here, here's what it's about. And here's what it got me through. And in the back of my head, I was like, well, that's not what that song's about. Like that's, uh, uh, that you, you don't know. You're, but I didn't say that. I, I, yeah. I, like, I thank yeah. him. But then later that night, I was lying in my hotel room and I remember thinking to myself like, oh no, like he's right and I'm wrong. That song is whatever it is to him. Yes. Um, uh, right. I think that's probably one of my favorite parts of art is, is you don't really, you only control it up to the moment you release it. And then it's for everybody else to decide what they're going to do with it. Um, Absolutely. Right. And I like that, right. That's that processing time where if you're sitting there afterwards and you're talking about a movie, everybody's going to take away something different because you've lived a different life than the next person beside you. And Absolutely. You. Yeah. yeah. I, I've had those conversations with so many people who have come in on this series where we've talked about that, where, and I'll ask them, and you actually answered the question before I even thought to ask it, because I usually ask that question. <laughs> you know, when you create the art, it's kind of like when you go into an art gallery and you see all of those paintings or those prints on the wall, the artiste had a certain vision, certain things going on yeah. in their day and their life and their experience, their journey that are reflected in that painting on the wall at the art gallery. But then these people come in looking at it and appreciating it. And they may see some of what the originator, the creator thought about when they were creating it, but then they stay sort of apply it to their own lives and they connect certain things that they've experienced to the art the person has at the museum. Same thing with music too. You'll hear, we'll all hear a song whatever it is, it could be even a Christmas song sure. and, and it'll hearken certain memories of our childhood, certain family, relatives, good times, this, that, and the other, but it's the same song. It's just, we're all hearing it differently. And that's kind of unique when you hear a guy come up to you and say, you know what, this is what I took from your art. It's kind of interesting, the oh, yeah. different perspectives and it, it sort of broadens it and gives it a bigger sort of, uh, easel in which to play on doesn't it oh totally i i think i agree with everything you said um i i think for me i like it that it makes you know you're not going to control how so, how it hits someone so you don't have to try to so for me what that allows you to do is in whatever art you're creating me at acting directing music writing uh, uh it allows for some ambiguity which I really enjoy in, in everything. Like uh, so some place where you don't tell people exactly how you would like them to think because they're going to do whatever they want with it anyway. So it's no longer your job to try and perfectly explain something. I Oftentimes when I'm writing songs, um, either for myself or for other artists, I'll, I'll, I'll love lines that are very vague, that are very ambiguous. And like it's a fine line between a song that totally no one knows what you're talking about and one that is extremely literal and carves out a, a very linear path. And for me, usually somewhere in the middle is like, you can put people on a advised path, but the ambiguity is, is, is excellent in art. I love double entendre too. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, totally. When you, that kind of wordplay in that is, 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 is a blast. I mean, it, it's, it's something to remember in life. Um, I find that like, you, your experience in the world would be completely different from the next person. Like everybody's going to have their own fully different experience. And it's, it's really, um, 
informative for some of the like tougher things in this world where it's like two people can get the same piece of information and it hits them completely differently. Uh, important to remember that when you're trying to relate to other people, be that mm -hmm. in art or just like yeah. out in the world, that it's like you're coming from two different places. You're kind of in your own full universe and you kind of Venn diagram overlap with people, but you're never going to be in the exact same place. Uh, I find that helpful to remember as to like why people can disagree so heavily about things that like you're, you're coming from two different places. So you got to try and find ways to communicate with each other. Which is kind of interesting. Yeah. Uh, I think years ago, um, I think it was in high school, there was a girl that I was dating and we had these fabulous philosophical conversations that would go to like five o'clock in the morning about the history of the planet. And I remember her saying something which I still to this day think about. She said, you know, I know what you want. And I said, what's that? She said, you wish that I could like really be in your head. Like mm -hmm. I can think every thought you're thinking as you're thinking it, feel every thought as you're feeling it to the depth that you're feeling it. And that it's that plugged in. She said, it's just, just the way this whole thing operates, humanity, earth, all of it. I could get pretty close, yeah. but I cannot be exact. The cells yeah. can't be exact. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to you? Oh, dude. To, and have you ever I, been told that too? <laughs> I, I think that's the like struggle of communication, right? Like we all want to be understood on some level, um, artists and otherwise, where where you you want people to understand what you're feeling. You you you. I I often like. <laughs> I just I will spend huge amounts of time just wondering what it's like in someone else's head. You know, like it, the the idea that like. I mean, this is this is a crude metaphor, but every time you look at a pillow, maybe somebody sees an elephant when they do that, or what my idea of an elephant is. It, it, bad metaphor, but yeah. but the idea that just like you you just really can't fundamentally know. Uh, no. but, and and I mean, it's easier to imagine inside another human's head, but you think about it like, oh, you're you're standing there beside a dog and what their experience is, or you're standing there uh, uh, and there's an ant on the on 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 the ground. Every every, every living creature is having its own little experience. Uh, that overlap some more so yeah. and some less. It's so. all together. Yeah, it, uh, it's very bizarre that we can all even be here at the same time, <laughs> and that this whole thing just works, right? Yeah. Um, I can only imagine what you question about the guy that cuts you off on the highway. What he's thinking about? <laughs> totally. Well, and that's the thing. You you often have to just be like, oh, but I've cut somebody off in the highway, and usually, usually, I'm not like. <laughs> <laughs> out to ruin their life it's you're probably preoccupied maybe something you, you, happened you shoulder check. maybe you're in a rush who knows but boy do you ever project on to the guy who cuts you off to be like this person must be a criminal who is just like out to ruin Gotta my go life. get him and yeah right. right yeah you seem to give people benefit of the doubt which i do too i, I you look I, you look for the good the positive I try to because I feel like you, I feel like I can usually understand it. You know, I feel like it's not that hard to, to usually like get inside someone's head. Like someone doesn't text you back. I can be like, well, I don't text people back sometimes. I don't do that intentionally. I don't usually set out to like vindictively cut someone off, but maybe you're late on something. Maybe you get distracted. Maybe something else opens on your phone. This is a tiny example, but I, I certainly try to, I think it's, it can be easier than we tend to make it to empathize yeah, and, and go like, Oh, okay, well I can imagine this person's pain in some way. I can imagine this person's joy in some way. I think it's really helpful to do that from time to time. Right. I think it's valuable at points in time to try and evaluate your own version of that as well. To go like, well, why do I do that? Why do I think like exactly. that? Um, Cause that's the, the giant life roller coaster we're on. Right. It's, right. It's, yeah. So an announcement for all of our dear friends, followers and viewers and family and everybody in Canada. Uh, when you see a guy zipping by pretty fast with a pink ski cap and a gray sweatshirt on, <laughs> he didn't mean it. I didn't mean it. <laughs> he has to get there quick. I got to go. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm definitely, I got, the, I got the middle finger out of that for sure. If you see me doing that, then I've it's, lost it. Uh, then, 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 then all bets are off. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, this is cool too. Tell us about this one also. Yeah, so this yeah, is another, congratulations this is another Kyle creation for sure. Um, yeah. It's kind of fun. This is kind of like 
you know, it's yeah, like, oh, the way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, man, my teeth's kind of matching it. Yeah, this one here, uh, this one's, again, like sort of product of my cabin. Um, it really it cool. honestly just feels like kind of a, a, a love letter to um, to just the, the speed of life that I like to live around here. That's my um, control, yeah. yeah, man, it, a lot of it uh, that the opening line of this is uh, when I feel too far gone, I throw on a song, something about Alan Jackson. He just gets me. Uh, oh, yeah. And that, and that was literally just every time I would drive up to my cabin for years, I would take this single Alan Jackson's greatest hits CD, put it in the console and, and, and play it. So m most of this song is just kind of like a, uh, <clears throat> like a checklist of all the stuff that I kind of love about, you know, my specific place up here, but I, I find it, it kind of cuts across like, kind of just a song about like that place for for anyone be it in a small town or in a big city that like that puts you in the right frame of mind i feel like you can get there through a lot of things it's the we memories all need the... a cabin of our own no matter what that cabin is yeah that cabin balance, can be a lot of things to balance the demands of everything else right to keep to re-energize replug to unplug and replug it's good that you're able to do that yeah i try to i mean it's it's tricky, right? Cause, uh, yeah. you know, even up here now, like I'm, I'm more connected here than like this place I'm, I'm here with you on, on through an internet connection here today that I many years ago, we didn't have that here. There was no, no there was no internet. There was no, uh, we didn't have TV up here. Um, yeah, it's, it's that in, it's kind of that ongoing battle for me of like to try and I just find when you spend, I feel like humans on an evolutionary level, we, we were kind of hardwired for an amount of interaction and awareness that we're like, kind of have the evolution to, to, to have where it's like, cool, maybe, maybe you, you're used to interacting with up to a hundred people in your small community. And that would have been humans for like a, for most of our uh, evolutionary history. And then somewhere in the last like few thousand years that really kicks up uh, uh, from like, okay, larger cities to really large cities to now you can look at a device that every person has in their pocket that will make you aware of the joy, pain, suffering, problems, oh, great times of every, every single point. person on the whole planet at the same time. And I, I don't think we're, we're set. I don't think we'll be set for that for a long time. I think it does things to your nervous system where it's like the, the fight or flight response is great when there's a yeah giant jungle cat chasing you it's really good because it's going to juice you with yeah. adrenaline and you're going to move faster so you don't get eaten by the cat the problem is the cat now is in your phone and you pick it up and it tells you things to be like, i should be a little worried about that oh mm. the, this is a work thing oh this is it's it's on a, it's like micro dosing adrenaline at all times the world is ending it's all over yeah. right? everybody hates everybody and sure. does it ever become overwhelming for you oh you in, need to just shut it in, off in entirely uh, I've, I've had that too yeah yeah. And I mean, it's, it's tricky because when your work necessitates, like for most people, right, you, you interact. We're with in computer. this world where yeah. it's all there. We're connected and plugged in. Yeah. I, you, you know, like I, the number of times where I've been like, right, I'm going to go post something on on Instagram and then I'm going to turn my phone off right after. And you find yourself like, you know, you're, you're, you're reading your way through. Uh, yeah. It's tricky. I think. Wait, for did anyone, you say something? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. It, it, and I mean, it's, it's, they're built to do it. They're, they're yeah, designed to do it. True. The tricky thing, it's kind of crazy when you have like the, typically the CEOs behind any smartphone company will, will say they don't let their kids use them. Cause, cause you know, they've got rooms and rooms and squads stuff. full yeah. of people that are like, you, you're, you're trying to monopolize uh, uh, eyeballs. The key thing is attention at, at this point in time. So yeah, for me, that's that probably love of analog things, love of nature of just like, I think it helps your brain to try and get it back to a speed that's closer to what humans were like for most of the time we've become humans. Uh, when we had rocks and we played yeah. with rocks. <laughs> yeah, totally. Games, you know? And, and it's like, there's huge benefit. Like, obviously that uh, I'm not someone who's like, yeah. like I, I interact with, I'm a pretty tech heavy guy. And like, there's, yeah. there's huge upsides to it. There's a lot of like right. beautiful innovation that's happened in the last you know, hundred years that has allowed people to live longer and better than they ever had before. But I, I do think there are some inadvertent consequences. Uh, I, th I, I mean, myself, probably because of my own industry, uh, uh, I feel social media and like smartphones are a dangerous one where it's like, they can be a lot of fun, but they can also kind of drag you into just, an unnatural state for yourself where yeah. if, if you're if you're every day you just see everyone having the best day of their life you got you ask, all why, am, why am i not having the best lobster day? right they're all yeah. hanging out with world leaders and sure right exactly i mean 
and I mean, I'm, I'm guilty of it, right? Like I, I used to have a, 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 I had a roommate who wanted to run a, a spoof uh, Instagram account beside mine and it, would, and it would be called the real West Mac. And it would be when I would post something that was like new album drops on Friday, he would post a picture of me like lying on the couch in my underwear where I'd done that from, you know, uh, where I'd be like, this is what Wes is currently actually doing. I, I almost feel like the, I, I, there's an app, uh, be real. I think that's tried to capitalize a little bit on that, where it's like, it forces you to post at a specific time of day and turns the back camera on yeah, to so just like to get one. Yeah, yeah. Just to get one step closer to like, what are people actually doing? Because I think when you compare what you're actually doing to what most people are actually doing, you feel a little more normal about everybody's life really doing the same and trying yeah. to survive it all. And, you know, we're living in this algorithm based world now. Oh, yeah. So all yeah. These yeah. Algorithms deciding what's best. What's this? What's that? Do this. Don't do that. No, it's very tricky. I mean, you they're extremely well designed to 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 feed i'm I, i'm sure everybody out there's experienced this you have a conversation about a tennis racket and all of a sudden you have an ad for a tennis racket on your phone it happens left right and center uh uh it is tricky is it that when, freaky i oh, mean yeah. I've, I've had i've had conversations with the technology off oh yeah and then turn on the smart TV or whatever, and all of a sudden there's an exact ad for that thing. Oh yeah, but the stuff was supposedly. Dude, not I've, I've on. had the same. I've had the same I'm on, like, on, on things that are too obscure too for it to like. One, one of them was this like particular T-shirt company that I had a conversation with my friend about, and like I know I'd never looked that company up on my phone. Like I'd spoken about it on a phone call, and and. And it was the next ad off. And I was like, man, they're definitely listening for sure. And like, or big brother. Oh, dude. And I mean, like, I'm not even like, I'm not someone who's like worried about personally, like my privacy. I, I feel like I'm pretty above board dude, but it's more for me of just like, man, there is so much thought going into what my thought will go into of like, when it is pre-chosen for you by an algorithm that is designed to push you towards things to, to, to reinforce your echo chamber, to move you towards products that you might want to purchase. Uh, it's a lot, man. You're, you're all of a sudden, it's very different than just like walking through the forest, mm -hmm. you know, uh, very, 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 very different. What inspires you to make music? Uh, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of different things that do during the course of your day. Are you, it sounds like you're always observing life, observing things that happen around you, experiences, hummingbirds that, that you take in and note and it's reflected in the music. How do you find the inspiration for the material? Yeah. I mean, a lot of different ways. Some of it like, I mean, I, I I had a dream like a night ago and I just woke up with like a very complete song in my head. And sometimes those ones will have very nonsensical uh, lyrics, but you get some interesting melodies. Sometimes it's if I'm, you know, feeling petty and wanting to write a hit song like somebody else, it'll be listening to that song and a few like it and seeing what the garbage dump of my brain will kind of churn that into. I find that could be helpful. Sometimes it's... I, th I think more than anything, it's usually incidental stuff, though, of like when you've done this long enough, um, your job more becomes making yourself able to drop everything, grab a pencil and paper or your phone and record it when it comes to you. Um, I find the best song ideas I've got. Usually I don't sit down to try and write a song. It's usually uh, I've heard like Spielberg talk about this for film stuff where he liked to mm -hmm. drive his car. I, I find driving a car uh having a shower eating breakfast just something that if you take your conscious mind which yeah. is great at doing all kinds of things but i find is often kind of weak at art a lot of the time um you can occupy it with a menial task of you know making your breakfast or something like that Every day. and you allow whatever your subconscious is which we seem to have a worse understanding of i certainly do uh to take it almost feels like it takes everything you've ever absorbed in your whole life and just kind of churns it around in this big vat. And every now and then something will boil to the surface. Uh, and I find it's, you want to try and grab onto that thing when it's there. And then for me, I like to log those ideas somewhere in a phone or a computer or a notebook. And then when it's time to do a song, right? Say I've booked one with another artist or some writers or something to bring out those ideas and go, cool, well, let's try and finish this. I find it's easier to take those like, pure inspiration nuggets kind of thing and then carve them into something else than to try and pull something from nowhere. Um, it's amazing you say that because, and I've referenced it a few times on this show with some other guests, Melissa Manchester, legendary singer, performer. She was a guest a couple of times on the show 
And like we talked about the songwriting process and inspiration. And she said, very close to what you just said. She said, I could have a dream. I could be walking from one room to the other in the house. The sun could be coming in the window a certain way. Anything could be happening where I'll get this burst of inspiration for a song. It might not be something that is polished and finished, but these bits and pieces are just coming up and out. She will run to the piano. She's got a recorder next to the piano, ready yeah. to go presses record and just starts working out through her. She's like a facilitator conduit of the totally, energy totally. and records that immediately as it's happening, because the longer you wait to say, Oh, I'll go back to it. It's yeah. It doesn't. It, it, everybody I know who is any good at this uh, has the same experience. Some people, you know, maybe think of it as like a cosmic thing. It's in the ether and you pull a song out. It feels like that for me. I kind of equate it. I, I like the idea that you're just, absorbing everything and that you have a background process in your brain that somewhere in like filing all of the electric signals, it, it's almost like it makes an error at some point and feeds you some piece of something that's I'm sure like a combo of 10 songs you've heard before, but now they're being mashed up by, by a part of your brain that you have poor control over. Uh, but the biggest thing that uh, I was reading a, a John Mayer thing, he's talking about that where it's like, that's the time you're, you're a writer. He's like, you want to write that, as hard and as long as you can, because then at some point it fades, the little, the, the feeling fades. And then you're into like the craft where you can use tools that me as like a songwriter, having done this for a long time, uh, can know, all right, here's a good way to get to a chorus. And if this is the chord progression we're rolling in a, ver a verse, this could work for a bridge, yada, yada, yada. And, and that stuff's great and is helpful, but isn't the like pure inspiration. That's the stuff that can help you finish the song. Um, but it's nice when you can grab onto that original, like electric kind of feeling. Um, cause you, I don't know. I, I don't find that I can write, uh, anywhere near as good as that when I'm just forcing it. Like I, you know, you, there's just a different feeling. It's, I'd be very, this is the stuff where I'm very curious, you know, a hundred, 200 years in the future, if, if humans will have a better concept of like, oh, what is that? Like, what are you accessing there? Like, how is your brain doing that? Is there some other like uh, a level of consciousness that floats around between all of us that you're tapping into? Uh, it, it excites me because every hundred years or whatever, if you roll the clock back, there's things that would have been totally not understood that we have a pretty solid understanding of now. It makes right. me very excited to go, huh? How do human emotions work like that? How does creativity work? How how, how does empathy work? How, how do those kind of understanding, the, we, we have a concept of it, but our study of the human brain is a very incomplete one at this point. Um, Sounds like, like you love psychology. Yeah, yeah, on, on yeah. some level, yeah. you know, psychology it's, and, and- It's fascinating, isn't it? I love it oh, too. To yeah. Totally, it's, it's, it's what makes people tick, right? Um, and I mean, that, that stuff, it's very interesting as we verge into like an AI era of like you have, it's a, it's a bizarro thing that we are creating an artificial intelligence that by all predictions will hit the singularity and become like a truly functional general AI that is like on par with us probably in our lifetimes. It's bizarre to be building something that we don't actually understand in ourself. Like it, it's a strange thing that like any of the the leading AI creators fundamentally will tell you like, okay, you chat GDP, it, 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 this is what it does, but they don't fundamentally know what their own product does inside itself past a point. They know the initial programming of it, but it is a machine that learns from itself. Uh, uh, so it's odd that we're creating intelligence when we don't actually understand our own intelligence our own like, at all. Selves. Yeah. yeah, it's very bizarre <laughs> to be building a race car with like no blueprint and be like, I don't know, we might be building a race car, who knows? Um, <laughs> but the paint job looks good on the Yeah, oh, the paint job looks great. And everyone's racing to make as much money off of it as they can. But like you, 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 it blows my mind. You get these quotes coming out from like the CEOs of each of these companies being like, like one of them being like, yeah, we're like 50, 50 that this thing will destroy us in the end. <laughs> like, but you're racing towards it. But let's you just, go. <laughs> um, yeah. Cause the, the rationale is well, somebody else will do it if we don't. So if we exactly. can get there first and we're on the correct side of that 50%, we'll be the richest people ever. Well, it's kind of like the internet too. Cause the internet, yeah. you know, all of a sudden boom. And, and it's like the wild, wild west unregulated. Oh, yeah. There's so many different things that happen. Good, bad, ugly. 
on it and and it's but it's there and everybody's a part of it and oh yeah it's just amazing you, you know the other thing too that uh, i want to make sure i highlight is this which i just scratched the surface on real quickly directing producing your directing and producing has earned you nominations for music video of the year director of the year at the ccma bccma leo awards while creating compelling narrative pieces for artists like the Juno Award winner, uh, Jess, he actually, that was fantastic. How did that all happen? So the Jess Moskaluk video um, for, uh, um, oh my God, for camouflage. Um, that was a neat one to get to put together. They, uh, Jess and her camp had, uh, Jess, a friend of mine, she's, she's wonderful and just like truly like class human, um, very talented, but also like very down to earth. She, she had asked me for, probably a couple of years if I wanted to do a video and, and typically I, I don't actually do a, a ton of directing for other artists, namely because it's, it's very time consuming to do one of those to the level that I like to do them. Um, but yeah, finally there was like a timing connection on it. And I was just like, I really love the song. And I'm like, Oh my God, I can't pass on this again because she like, I like she's just awesome. And then the, the potential was all there. So yeah, I wrote, wrote out a treatment for it. And um yeah, I think we made something really special on that one. It you know, it deals it digs pretty hard into a bunch of mental health stuff um, that we portrayed in a, this interesting visual format using a bunch of UV lights. I, I think we stuck the landing on it, but it, it was like um, those things are just such a music videos are, are total chaos for me. I find when you really delve into them and you've got the so I guess it's like when you're working on a film. Um, you know, you're going to bring all these people together and you're going to shoot for a few weeks or a month or whatever, but most music videos, you got to pull the whole thing together and do it in one or two days max. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of, you have to build this machine that you don't get to put on the road until the day of, and it's got to run flawlessly out of the gate. Um, and I remember like the first day of shooting the Jess video, we were like down to the wire on time and like we were doing, we did that French reverse thing I was talking about to like get, get a couple of the shots at the end. And, and unfortunately the second day of it, uh, me and the cinematographer were laughing. The film gods really paid us back and just like gave us this, it had been raining all day and then it stopped raining for the duration of the shoot window. The sky opened up and gave us all these, these beautiful shots and, and, and lighting and can't control any of that kind of stuff. But yeah, I, I it was a, it was a blast to get to make that. That was when uh, myself and my girlfriend, Emma Flemington, she was a creative director on that. And my best friend Newman worked on it. And I, it, it was just like a really fun group of people getting to do something that felt, uh, felt important. And I, I think Jess was really happy with the product in the end. So that was, that was, that was super cool. And, and I think the song went on to be like a top 10 and nominated us for some stuff. So it was fantastic. Uh, yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a blast to be part of. Some of the, you know, the icing on the cake are the, you know, nominations, awards, yeah. recognition, and, and which is amazing. And it is kind of icing on the cake in that, like, you do this long enough, you realize, like, awards are a strange thing. Once you kind of know how you, how the sausage is made on that, you can never unknow it. Um, and sometimes I have benefited from that process, and sometimes I'm not part of that process. Um, when you get to have a nod for something like that it feels lovely you know if it's a piece of work that you really care about in 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 that case uh we loved the thing that we created and i felt really proud of it so it was nice to, that it was able to do the additional little victory lap there and, and and pick off some of that stuff um but in the end for for me it's more like you know that stuff's so out of your control so all, all you try and do is come in and and make the video and be truthful to some kind of vision for it you ever do any uh voiceover work or narrations not really, you know. It's something I've I've wanted to get into. I got the vocal quality <laughs> just in the speaking voice for that. Oh, yeah. thank you. I, I I've been told I uh, I'm I'm good at making people fall asleep as well. If I want to do a monotone read, but I can do a thing. And uh, yes, when you do the, the, um, but you know, it, it's one of those things you you read off my my bio on this. I would love to do more voice acting, but it becomes a time thing where I've I've intentionally kind of swatted that away. In the same way, I, I remember at one point being like you know, I could get into doing visual effects. I could get better at that and use that in my own videos where I've had to sort of draw some lines to be like, I, I feel like I'm stretched sometimes to my maximum already um, with a bunch of the stuff that I have have going. Uh, and so that's one where I'm like, yeah, it'd be I, I really enjoy that kind of stuff and have great admiration for some of my like favorite voice artists. Um, 
would love to do that at some point, but I know it, like anything else in this business, you really got to apply a lot of power to it. It um, becomes a total focus, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I know people who are deep into that where it's yeah. like, oh, man, yeah. you, you work hard. Um, yeah. So it, it's, it's something that I have a great interest in. And if life happens to toss me an opportunity or a chunk of time where I can do more of that, that would be great. It's on the list. Uh, yeah. The website too to keep up on uh, uh, you know with all this incredibleness that's happening for you, Wes. Westmacmusic.com. Yeah, and I mean I'm I'm probably way more active on social media of like at Westmac Music on whatever social media platform Instagram. you're on. But also yeah, Westmac yeah. Music will send you to those. Um, but yeah. most of the like current stuff is more yeah. Like Instagram is probably where I'm doing the most stuff. Instagram and. Uh, why do you love what you're doing? What are some of those blessings and joys in your life, Wes, that keep you so connected and creative continually presenting all this great material for all of us to enjoy, my friend? I think a lot of it for me is just like, you know, and this wasn't maybe the way it was when I started, you know, you, you get into this because you really want to do it. And, and, and I feel like I'm in it now, not just because I want to do it, but because I need to do it, where it's like there are elements of making music and art that are just really good for my brain. Uh, me, if I can sit down and write a song with some people, I usually for the rest of the day will feel pretty good about myself. It'll feel like I've done the thing that I know how to do and it scratches an itch somewhere in my, in my brain that, that feels good. And I, it's a kind of maybe simple and self-serving answer, but Are you like, hard on yourself. Do you, do you demand a lot from yourself? I think so. I, I think you, you get into this and unfortunately probably spend too much time thinking about all the things that you want and want to do and things that you want to make. And man, like as busy as you can get yourself, you only have one life. And so it's, it's, I at times feel like, man, there's just so many things I want to do and see and be a part of and people I want to know and work with be that creatively or just to hang out and chat. Um, and so I, I definitely, yeah, I feel like I'd pick myself apart a fair bit for wanting to do more. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm at my best mental health wise when I can feel more gratitude and feel more ease. And I find the actual act of creating something gives me a lot of that. The, the act of marketing something, the act of pushing it out sometimes doesn't help. You know, it's, it's the, it's the other side. It's the uncontrollable. It's you fraying into the storm and being like, cool. Sometimes I'm the leaf riding gracefully through the storm and sometimes you're the plastic bag getting tossed all over the place on the days where i'm writing on the days where i'm recording something on the days where i'm actually acting and not just uh, auditioning or editing or anything like that when you're th those are the days that that make it all feel very worth it and feel inspirational and just again make me feel nice in my head Beautifully said, and it's so true. You know, art can really, if you get a chance to express the the essence of who you are and what's in your DNA through the way that you do it, Wes, there's nothing better. You're, you're then totally plugged in and sharing it with the world. And it's awesome. And I know that one of the things on that huge bucket list was to come on the Gym Master Show Live series. And so now you can- It was, you can it was. that off. And, uh, and believe it or not, folks, he watches our show. He said he's caught other episodes and he likes the vibe, which I think is awesome. Good. Well, I mean, to turn this over briefly to you, because uh, uh, I feel like you've even rained my accolades on me here. You, 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 you've got something, uh, uh, the, the levity that you've uh, used to describe in the past is, is very present here. You, you're, you've got a great way with people. This has been- very enjoyable and, and me getting to watch some of your other clips. It's um, you have a nice mixture of, of depth and empathy and perspective that are fun to watch, fun to chat with you on. And yeah, it's a nice slice of slowing the world down for a little chunk of time here uh, uh, to enjoy something and to get to share some kind of human connection. So I really appreciate you, uh, you chatting with me here today and then having that moment. Pleasure is all mine, my friend. And you're, as I say, we'll keep the porch light on for you and you're welcome back anytime. And, you know, next time you come back, we don't have to chat this long unless you want to, and you got a lot of things to share. It's just nice, you know, for the first time, have this little extended thing for people to really get an appreciation of you, your work, who you are, your passion, why you love doing what you're doing, how you do what you do. And then, you know, as you have other things that are popping up, you want to, you know, hop on to tell us about, 
whether it's for 20 minutes, 40 minutes, 15. Well, I don't think we've ever done 15. <laughs> 15 just to say the gym master show. <laughs> but maybe 30 minutes or whatever. You know, you're welcome back. Uh, It'd be as, my pleasure. Uh, you know, and, and spread the word about our show. You know, other yeah. folks think like to pop on. Uh, they're all welcome from literally all genres of uh, of existence and life and uh, our wonderful dear mutual friend Leslie Diana watching in Canada says Jim does his research for his guests and it shows we learned a lot about Wes's career fun interview thanks guys thank you as well Leslie, thanks, Leslie. watching in Canada she certainly is Kathleen in New York City says we love having you here Wes she's thanks, one of Kathleen. our loveties Merlin who's in Ontario uh, she's been with us a long time. Thanks, Wes, for being here with us. You are now a love tea And uh, she checked out You Drive Me Crazy. She loved it. Oh, which so is glad. awesome. And uh, <laughs> I'm seeing all the comments now. Chat more, chat more. Else. Maureen, you want more? <laughs> <laughs> He's got to stretch his legs. He's probably thirsty. He probably wants a sandwich. <laughs> you know? I mean, I always want a sandwich. He's got to let the cat out. out. <laughs> Oh, this, well, seriously, thank you so much to everybody uh, who tuned into this and, and this everybody is, in the comments yeah, here. Live, times. and I encourage folks to, uh, if you really enjoyed this uh, episode, to do something special. Leave a comment to the comments section on our YouTube channel. Give it a like, subscribe to Jim Masters TV and all the rest. My friend, this was really a fantastic conversation, one of many, I'm sure. And uh Let's definitely stay in touch. You're always welcome here. And I wish you nothing but continued because you've already got a lot of success that's uh, under the belt. Continued success in everything you do that you want to do as you go along, my friend. Jim, thank you so much. This has been an absolute blast. Thanks for having me on the show. I'd as love my, to be back. As my father told me when I was seven years old and has always said this sort of, you know, like you talk about your dad as an inspiration, my father inspiring man says seven years old to me now jim whenever anybody says something kind or nice to you we always remember this say thank you very much then ask them to please put it in writing and address it management <laughs> <laughs> yeah i need more of that so, that's so a, true huh right comment Even, on the old youtube page that's <laughs> it right that's it address it management all right my friend go get that sandwich let that cat out <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you again soon okay will do congratulations will do. on pleasure. hummingbird and everything else that's happening thank you so much jim have a wonderful night you too cheers bye